Good morning and welcome everybody to our uh, South East NHS England led uh, webinar on understanding the changes made in Hampshire, Isle of Wight, Southampton and Portsmouth in relation to child suicide. This is one of a few webinars that are looking to capture some of the learning uh, that has emerged in the South East uh, around children's mental health. And in this webinar, we'll have the privilege of listening to colleagues from Public Health, from Hampshire Constabulary, from the Hampshire Isle of Wight Portsmouth Southampton Safeguarding Executive, so the chair, and the chair of the Child Death Overview Panel for our region. I appreciate that this is not an easy conversation. Child suicide arouses all kinds of feelings and thoughts and emotions, uh, and we understand that. Today, what we're going to talk about is some of our local learning in relation to child suicide and some of the things we've really started to focus on in response to that learning to improve outcomes for children. And there are three key things we'd want to describe in that, and you can see more of that detail in the information linked to this webinar. The first change is that all of our statutory partner agencies and our voluntary community and faith sector have supported us to ensure that suicide prevention training, the Zero Suicide Alliance training, reaches as many staff and volunteers as we can to build confidence and the uh, clarity on how to respond to somebody if you're worried that they may be experiencing suicidal ideation. The second thing is that we have honed and refined the questions that we ask in the first 24 to 48 hours following the tragic loss of a child in suicide. We've done that intentionally because that helps us understand who has been affected by that loss. That helps us support those affected parties. And you'll understand that what we learn in that first 24 to 48 hours also involves both our statutory safeguarding functions and our design of children's mental health services. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over now to and welcome Amy McCulloch. Amy, welcome from Public Health. Do you want to say uh, who you are, please? Yes, so I'm Amy McCullough. I'm a consultant in public health at Southampton City Council and one of the portfolios I lead on is mental health and wellbeing across the life course and including suicide prevention. Amy, you're most welcome, thank you. Could you uh, provide us with some context about both your role and also deaths by suicide uh, for children and young people in the UK generally? Yes, of course. So. To provide some context to my involvement and my role, um, public health professionals working in local authorities have a responsibility to coordinate action to prevent deaths by suicide in their local authority area. And like all other local authority areas in Southampton, we have a suicide prevention plan in place, which outlines the different actions that we and partners across the system will take to prevent deaths by suicide. And preventing deaths by suicide is, of course, hugely important because of the loss of life to the person involved, the huge impact of losing a loved one for family and friends, the impact on the local community, and indeed the wider cost to society and the economy from early loss of life. And in relation to how big a public health need deaths by suicide in children and young people is, well, whilst the highest proportion of death by suicides are in adults, suicide is the leading cause of death in young people in the UK. So it accounts for 14% of deaths in 10 to 19 year olds and 21% of deaths in 20 to 34 year olds. The UK does have a relatively low rate of suicide by children and young people compared to other countries, though we know that between 2013 and 18, we've seen an increase nationally, um, which reversed a decline in the previous 10 years. Despite this rise and suicide being a leading cause of death in children and young people, when looking at the numbers of deaths, suicide does, however, remain a rare occurrence. Um, and in Hampshire and Isle of Wight, our all age suicide rates have actually decreased for the same time period, so 2013 to 18. So deaths by suicide in children and young people is rare, but nevertheless a leading cause of death in young people. And obviously, as I've said, of huge importance. Thank you, Amy. I wonder if you would talk us through how this work uh, in our particular area first started and why it's so important, please. Yes, yeah, so in working with Andrew and partners at the Hampshire Wide Children and Young People's Mental Health Steering Group meeting, 
it became clear that whilst there are good systems and processes in place to gather and share information about deaths by suicide involving children and young people, we can improve current systems by taking four relatively simple actions. So I'll take you through those now. So firstly, by utilising our local authority suicide audits to analyse deaths by suicide in children and young people specifically, and get a more comprehensive understanding of, for example, risk factors for suicide in children and young people in our local area, and the information recorded and analysed through the audits, and importantly, what isn't recorded or extracted, and so the gaps in our knowledge that we could potentially address. And then the second step involves using this information to inform discussion about potential approaches to enhance data gathering and recording in relation to deaths by suicide in children and young people. And so this is where, for example, Dave will talk about improvements to the rapid response procedure and the additional questions that will be recorded in the first 24 to 48 hour period after a death by suicide. And then the third step is to utilise this enhanced intelligence to inform immediate action by key agencies to support families, schools and communities following a child's suicide, such as postvention, and then to inform longer term suicide prevention planning. And by postvention, I'm referring to the intervention taken after a suicide, largely taking the form of support for the bereaved, and this is really important as we know that family and friends of a, of a person that has taken their own life are at increased risk of suicide themselves. And then finally, the fourth step is to work with all system partners to ensure that intelligence about deaths by suicide is shared in a timely way between key partners to the benefit of suicide prevention. So that includes information gained through the rapid response procedure, as I've just mentioned. It includes receiving notifications of suspected deaths by suicide from Hampshire Constabulary as real time as possible, what we refer to as real time surveillance. And another example is ensuring that lessons learned and recommendations from the Child Death Overview Panel inform multi-partnership suicide prevention plans. So this work is essentially about identifying intelligence gaps, enhanced data collection and recording, and improved systems for sharing intelligence to inform both the immediate response to a, to a death by suicide and then the longer term suicide prevention planning. And whilst this work has always been important, in the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic, there is a new urgency to get processes such as this in place. It's widely acknowledged that the pandemic is having and will have a major impact on people's mental health and well-being, including that of children and young people. And nationally, we know that suicide is likely to become a more pressing concern as the pandemic has longer term effects on the general population, on the economy and vulnerable groups. We know that experiences of bereavement will increase as well. And the impact of the lockdown on related family issues such as domestic violence and debt are likely to be significant. So coronavirus may therefore increase exposure to risk factors for suicide in the short term, but also in the longer term via exposure to traumatic childhood experiences, the impact of which may manifest later in life. But finally, with COVID, there is also a renewed energy around partnership working and partners are working really well together across systems on multiple issues, including suicide prevention. And so it really is a very good time to review what intelligence is being recorded, analysed, shared and used to inform the immediate response around a death by suicide and then the longer term suicide prevention planning. Amy, thank you so much. I wonder if you could tell us, and we've produced some slides here to support you at this stage, uh, what our analysis uh, told us about the gaps in our knowledge uh, that we needed to respond to in partnership together. Yes, yeah, so in order to undertake the analysis on deaths by children and young people, um, data on those people that had died by suicide and were under 25 years was extracted from each of the relevant local authority suicide audits for the period 2014 to 18. So from Southampton, Portsmouth, Hampshire and Isle of Wight audits. And a suicide audit is essentially an exercise whereby public health professionals examine coroner's records for all deaths by suicide in a specific local authority. And that's to gain intelligence on the circumstances surrounding and preceding a death, which we can then use to inform our work on suicide prevention. Um, whilst there are limitations with the analysis, which are highlighted on the attached slides, 
Um, this analysis of our suicide audit did tell us a number of important things. So I'll take you through those now. So in terms of risk factors, a large proportion, around 65 to 70% of children and young people in the sample had a history of mental health need. And this represents the full spectrum of need from the more frequently seen anxiety and depression to serious mental illness. There was a history of previous self-harm of any form in over half of all cases. And that's why in any suicide prevention plan, um, there needs to be consideration of self-harm as a risk factor for suicide, as well as self-harm in its own right. And then half of the sample of children and young people had documented um, relationship issues, so that's a significant risk factor. Approximately one third of children and young people had a documented history of alcohol and or drug use, and a majority of these have been current users. And then over 10% of children and young people had experienced interaction with the criminal justice system. And then in relation to adverse childhood experiences, we used the consensus list of 10 ACEs to support extraction of risk factors from the suicide audits as well, and added in other risk factors to the extraction framework that we thought were important, such as bullying, bereavement and being in the care system. Whilst they represent recorded risk factors, they don't comment, of course, on the severity of the risk factor for each child or young, young person. So from this analysis, we only know that they occurred. So when taking into account the 10 ACEs and the experience of bereavement, bullying or being in care, approximately a third of our children and young people in the sample were considered to have had a traumatic childhood. And the analysis highlighted the fact that often children and young people who die by suicide have experienced multiple traumatic events. So it's really one thing that is the sole cause. And then more than 15% of children and young people were documented to have experienced bereavement, which is an obvious concern in the current context of the pandemic. Um, many of these risk factors are identified in the 2017 National Confidential Inquiry into Suicide and Homicide by people with mental health, mental illness for children and young people nationally. So risk factors that we are seeing locally are also reflected nationally. And the analysis also tells us a number of important um, information about contact with services prior to death by suicide. So, for example, in this analysis, around thir a third of children and young people were documented as having at some point been in contact with mental health services, but a larger proportion had not been in contact. So these are children and young people that were potentially not on the radar of, radar of mental health services. And that's really important to bear in mind when trying to reach out to children and young people. You have to reach into the community via various channels and not just through our established health services. And then around 20% of cases were noted to have seen their GP within one month of the end of their life. So this is an important point at which intervention could take place. And then another key learning is that very few of the children and young people based on the documentation available were considered to have taken their own life out of the blue in the sense of having no clear previous vulnerability or documented recent events, including mental health issues. So therefore, raising awareness of risk factors, ensuring prompt recognition of issues and diagnosis and taking action where opportunities arise are all really key within suicide prevention. And then finally, as I've mentioned, we wanted the analysis to also identify what information was not available and which could potentially be recorded for enhanced data collection. And we found that the following information was not available for all of the majority of children and young people. So in relation to their ethnicity, their faith or cultural heritage, whether or not they had a learning disability or SEND status, their gender identity and previous exposure to suicide, and also the protective factors for suicide um, were not always there to analyze. It, an analyze. So in summary, the analysis tells us some very important things about the profile of children and young people taking their own life by suicide, the risk factors that can precede a death by suicide and where we have gaps in knowledge. So where enhanced data collection and recording would be beneficial. Thank you, Amy. That's so comprehensive and clear. I wonder finally if you would mind just giving us a view on why working in partnership matters so much. Yeah, so anyone working in suicide prevention will have heard the phrase suicide prevention is everyone's business and that's very true a multi-partnership approach is absolutely crucial and that's why we have a multi-agency partnership to develop our suicide prevention plans and oversee their implementation 
Health services are obviously crucial in preventing suicides or deaths by suicide, but as mentioned earlier, many people who take their own life by suicide aren't known to specialist health services. And that's where other services and what I refer to as key touch points are really crucial. So that includes teachers, youth workers, those that lead after school clubs, as well as school nurses, GPs and other health professionals, for example. And all those people that are in frequent contact with children and young people have the opportunity to identify mental health need in children and young people, to talk to them about it and support them to access services. And that's why it's really important to ensure that training is available to support people in gaining these skills and the knowledge and confidence to identify need and have these conversations with our children and young people. And then finally, the public, um, family, friends, communities are also a key partner if we continue to break down stigma around mental health, which prevents children and young people asking for help. And we can get more people talking about mental health that will really help children and young people to have conversations with others that may be absolutely crucial in their gaining support. Thank you, Amy. So that final note of how important it is that we talk about how we feel the difference that can make uh, is something we need to hold on to. We're going to turn now and uh, talk with Dave West from Hampshire Constabulary, who will talk us through some of the uh, finer details from a policing perspective. Thanks so much for making the time to join us amongst everything else that you're managing at the moment. Uh, would you mind letting everybody who's watching know who you are and what you do? Yep. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Dave West. I'm a detective inspector on the child abuse investigation team. And I currently chair the Joint Agency Response Quarterly Review that looks to examine the initial partnership response to uh, child death. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so we've got two questions to talk through with you from a policing perspective, please. Um, the first is, could you talk us through the process for uh, JAR uh, and, and what that involves? And, and also talk us through the questions that we're now asking in that first 24 to 48 hours following a suspected suicide. Yeah, so uh, a JAR, a joint agency response, is usually triggered uh, when a child dies unexpectedly or where the cause of death is not immediately clear. So this will include circumstances where self-harm or suicide is suspected. Just to um, explain what the objectives are of the, the joint agency response, uh, as a group of partners, we're there to establish as far as possible the cause or the causes of child death, to identify any potential contributory or modifiable factors, uh, to deliver ongoing support to the family through the provision of a key worker, uh, we look to provide some safeguarding to, to the surviving children and the wider family, and that can in include um, school communities, particularly when we're talking about uh, children who have committed self-harm or, or suicide. We ensure that all our statutory obligations are met, and probably most importantly is that we look to learn the lessons to reduce the risks of future child death. So the full process for a joint agency response is set out in guidelines that is most commonly referred to as the Kennedy Reports. Its more formal name is the Sudden Unexpected Death in Infancy and Childhood Multi-Agency Guidelines for Care and Investigation. So we can see why we why we phrase it as the Kennedy Reports. Yes. But uh, the initial response to a child death requires the police to appoint a lead investigator to fully, uh, fully and sensitively investigate um, the circumstances. And that's a role that in Hampshire Police will fall to the detective inspector within the child abuse investigation team, such as myself. So an effective initial response will include the timely sharing of information between professionals, a respectful and careful physical examination of the child with a consultant paediatrician, a joint home visit and examination of the site of collapse with a health professional, and the taking of a detailed and careful history from the parents or family. So following the conclusion of the initial response, an immediate meeting, um, or previously called JAR phase ones, of professionals is coordinated, and that's usually coordinated by the lead health professional, provided in, in Hampshire's case, through specially trained safeguarding nurses within Solent or Southern Health NHS. I say usually because there will be those occasions where we're investigating potentially a suspicious death and on those occasions it will be down to the police to, to lead and coordinate those immediate meetings. So the contact with the parents and the family and the home environment provide the best opportunity to identify any contributory or modifiable factors suspected to be connected to the death. So during the initial response we will we'll look to explore 
whether this child is subject to any child protection planning or supportive intervention, whether the child was in care or was a recent care leaver, whether the child was open to CAMS or any other mental health provision or support service, have there been any previous attempts of suicide or concerns regarding self-harm or suicide ideation? Uh, what is the child's ethnicity, faith or cultural heritage? And has the child expressed any personal feelings concerning their sexual orientation or, or gender identity? So these, these factors um, can, can be explored during that uh, initial response because of the contact that we have with the family, because of the information sharing that, that takes place amongst partners. But uh, to, as one can imagine, it's quite a raw time. So um, we will continue to look to explore each of those areas throughout that initial response, whether it uh, remains with the police at the hospital or uh, together as a group of partners in that immediate meeting that usually follows within 24 hours of, of the child's death. So Hampshire Police uh, with Southern and Solent NHS have agreed to support the strategic analysis of suicides by sensitively exploring these, these potential factors that might identify groups that are at great risk and need of support. Dave, thank you so much. That's a really helpful and clear answer. And thanks for the sensitivity you've offered to, because this is a difficult subject to talk about, isn't it? Um, lastly, my last question for you is, how does this approach help us to support the loved ones and, and friends who are affected uh, by this suicide? So these questions will um, hopefully provide us with a greater understanding around that child and, and what has happened in, those, in that initial response. So that's, that's vital information that will help the chair of the joint agency response to identify an appropriate key worker. So this is a single named point of contact who will be, able, who will be available to the family throughout the process. Um, the key worker is expected to be a reliable and accessible point of contact who can signpost the family to sources of support. And for that reason, uh, we, we can probably see the key worker falling to either child social care, the police, uh, education, ELSAs, designated safeguarding leads, maybe even the specialist safeguarding nurses themselves, but having a greater understanding as to why we've gathered as a group of professionals in response to that child death will help us nominate the right person to fulfil that key worker role. They're expected to be the family's voice amongst other professionals, which may prove useful, to, as I say, to, to schools who will probably be looking to provide them bereavement support and the wider school community. So it's a it's a hugely demanding role, uh, that key worker role, but a hugely essential role that needs to win the trust and confidence of families. So a better understanding as to why uh, how their child has died and why will help us nominate the right person to support them through that, that terrible time. Mm. Dave, thank you. And a huge thanks on behalf of us all, I think, to everybody who fulfills that key worker role, because it's so important. And we'll hear a little bit later on uh, from the uh, leaders of the Child Death Overview Panel and from the Safeguarding Executive about how this information also helps us inform preventative services. So to try and prevent other people taking their lives in this way. Uh, colleagues, we're going to turn now to, to listen to the final two uh, sector leaders uh, in our conversation. And we're going to start firstly uh, with Nicola. Nicola, would you like to introduce yourselves and let everybody know who you are and what you do, please? Thank you. Um, I'm Nicola Brownjohn. I'm the independent chair for the Child Death Overview Panel for Hampshire, Isle of Wight, Portsmouth and Southampton. Wonderful. You're most welcome, Nicola. I wondered if you would give us a perspective, please, on how gathering this information is going to help us support the functions of the Child Death Overview Panel uh, and more importantly, improve outcomes for our children and young people. Yes. So the, the Child Death Review process already has the requirement to gather this information, but it's all reliant on the quality of how it's done. And so when a child dies, there's reporting and investigatory requirements set out in the Child Death Review Statutory and Operational Guidance um, published in 2018. And, and, and as Dave would have sort of mentioned, the, the, the joint agency response is the first stage um, if, a, if the death was triggered and it was unexpected or such as suicide. Key to all child deaths is the need for notification, reporting and analysis 
And so for unexpected death, there needs to be an immediate action to jointly investigate and support um, families as well. And child suicides would definitely require a joint agency response. And from a child death overview panel perspective, that's what we would expect. So that's from a local perspective, looking at experts in um, mental health and key professionals around education, social care and health on an operational local footing. And for for the reporting at this stage, there's, there's for, for some uh, deaths, there's a particular a supplementary form, and this includes one for suicide. So there's a really in-depth um, investigation to gather that information that's available. And that can really help then. And it, there there is then a, a child death review meeting locally. So it gathers all that local detail about that one particular child. And then that's reported up to the strategic child death overview panel, which is on a much wider footprint. And it's it's expected that it's not going to be just one death across that wider footprint. And so therefore, um, suicide is one of the areas that we would probably expect to do a themed panel so we can invite more um, a, a particular specialists and really engage in that wider suicide um, work that's going on. And when we look at child deaths, there's a four pronged approach to the basis of the analysis of the death. And the first one is the factors intrinsic to the child. So the age, the gender, ethnicity, the issues that Amy sort of uh, has spoken about, the behavioural issues um, and disability. The second area is around factors in the social environment, including the family and the parent capacity. So that might be around the structure and functioning of the family or around the school or social integration surrounding that child. The third area is factors in the physical environment. So there might be issues around neighbourhood safety or home safety. And then the fourth area is particularly important, which is the factors in service provision. So that's any issues around um, assessment, investigations and diagnosis of any underlying issues that the, the young person or child might have had. And that's it, it's key for, for deaths by suicide if the child has been known to services or maybe has been missed. So, so the child death overview uh, review panel will look at that across a number of deaths and then be able to pull out some of key learning to prevent future deaths by suicide. So that might be something uh, as such as um, not fi finding that the services in place that schools aren't getting and um, you know access to to cams uh, in uh, the advice or that 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 sort of thing it's just we can really sort of really bring depth to to that that situation um and i think sort of from the outcomes for for children that's the intention of the child death overview panel is to really dig down into what has been uh, as, has been the learning from those deaths to enable services um, to and partnerships to really develop what they're doing to prevent those in the future. Lovely. Nicola, thank you so much for giving us that overview and insight. I'll turn now to Derek. Derek, welcome. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself so that everybody knows who you are and what you do? Thank you. Um, I'm Derek Benson. I'm the uh, independent chair for each of the four uh, local safeguarding children's partnerships, Hampshire, the Isle of Wight, Southampton and Portsmouth. And in addition, I also chair what's called the HIPS executive, the executive that sits um, to bring together the safeguarding partners from children's social care, health and police in each of the four partnerships to look at areas of common interest across the wider Hampshire area. Lovely, Derek, thank you so much. I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about uh, why the Hampshire, Isle of Wight, Southampton and Portsmouth safeguarding executive leaders have been so supportive of these developments. I think uh, listening to uh, everybody's contribution to this webinar, it's apparent just what an important issue this is. Hearing about the, the necessity to learn from each of these tragic cases uh, to try and prevent any more cases happening wherever that's possible and to make sure that all the professionals are best equipped to help in whatever way they possibly can. Um, I think we've heard how important partnership is. I think in these times of uh, reduced capacity in some agencies, 
that coming together to allow us to be more than the sum of our parts. So that little piece of information that one agency, one individual may have that if they share with others, may just help us prevent one of these tragedies. Jerry, thank you so much. We really appreciate your support um, and the support that gives to our frontline workers, whoever they work for, responding in these really difficult uh, situations. We'd like to thank all of our uh, staff and volunteers who are helping uh, us to prevent uh, this kind of tragedy wherever we are able and to support those affected uh, by loss by suicide. Colleagues, thank you so much for spending time listening to us today. I really hope that it's been helpful. You'll find in the attached information further details on the changes that we've made and some guidance on if you want to replicate these kinds of uh, focuses and changes in your local area, how you might go about doing that. And crucially, the Zero Suicide Alliance training that we'd really appreciate your help rolling out to everybody that you know. Uh, if you've been affected by anything that we've talked about today, please do reach out to those in your local mental health services, support within organisations, the people there to help and support you. These issues and this need affects all of us. Please do ask for help if you need it and please do help us as we continue to raise awareness on how important our partnership working to prevent these kinds of losses can be. Thank you so much for your time and we wish you well. Goodbye.